so that unfortunately keeps her out of the top tier, and we're going to have to put her down in silver. <laughs> Antoinette did not like that. And here's Dirk creeping on Antoinette again. My goodness. Good morning, Cupcakes. It is a beautiful morning here on the Freedom Farm. I hope your day is going wonderfully. Today we're doing something a little different. We've got the Blue Feather here. Now you get the Blue Feather in your second year when you reach Orange Heart with one of the marriage candidates. But... The question is, which one of those marriage candidates should get this blue feather? Today, we are going to be discussing that, and more. And uh, let's get started. So first up is Antoinette. Quiet and self-involved, her hobby is making clothing and accessories. She likes desserts and tea, and she hates fish. Antoinette's mother is obsessed with her job that being a fashion designer in the city. You never actually meet her. In fact, I don't think she even comes to the wedding if you marry her, which is really sad. But you see, Antoinette understands that her mother's obsession with her work is not good, and it's the children that suffer the most when their parents put temporary pleasures, including a job in which they find pleasure, over family. And as for her father, well, her father is just so desperate to please her mother because her mother is the loudest voice. And that's the other thing that she understands, is she understands that her father is seeking to please everyone, but in doing so, he lets the more passive voices, like him and Antoinette, suffer for the sake of the louder ones, like her mother. She is a bit standoffish and distant at first, but she does warm up to you after a while. She still remains a bit haughty, and that's probably a means to distance herself from those around her. The Antoinette review has been mostly positive so far, with a little bit of difficulty at first, but there's more, and we're going to have to go a little negative. Now, I'm not going to explain about Harry Harlow and how Antoinette was one of his chimpanzees that was never allowed to receive love from its parents, but she's basically that, and so she has some social issues. And it's because of these issues that she might have trouble being a mother to her children. If you do marry her, you're going to have to accept that your children will likely have two mothers. Antoinette, the biological mother, and Sherry, who the children will see as more of a motherly figure than Antoinette. Now, with some time, and a lot of love, and encouragement... She may actually get to the point where she can be a mother to them, but it's going to take a while. And so that unfortunately keeps her out of the top tier, and we're going to have to put her down in silver. Now that we're done reviewing the first waifu, I would just like to take a moment to remind you to do all that YouTube algorithm stuff everybody's always bragging about. Like in, subscribe in, and let me know who your favorite waifu of Grand Bazaar is in the the comments down below. All that stuff really does help me out and it does help my videos show up in your inbox more consistently. So please do not forget to do that. Next up is Daisy. Although a little clumsy, she's the hotel's hardworking maid. She likes candy and sweets and she hates spicy foods. So Daisy has to be on this list because technically she is a marriage candidate. Okay, but let me explain to you something. The reason why she's a marriage candidate is because every game cart sold has a chip on it. And if you marry Daisy in-game, this chip contacts the FBI and has them show up to your door the next day. That is why. Daisy is not a waifu. If you call her a waifu, I'm going to be calling Chris Hansen on you. She is scrap metal tier. And right after that we have Emiko, a very strange and mysterious woman. Likes simple things, and dislikes cooked food. Emiko is supposed to be a... I'm not sure, how do you pronounce this? Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Yamate kudasai. I don't know, the, the idealized Japanese woman. I, I think. I can't say for sure. 
But really, she comes off more as a... Himemori? Hidamori? Oh, oh. Hikikomori. Yeah, I can Japanese. A shut-in. She is stupidly difficult to marry. She only unlocks in your second year, and she requires 120 gifts, which... By the way, it's a little materialistic. She pretends to be spiritual, and even decries owning too many things, and yet wants all the things if you're going to marry her. It gets worse, though. She has no loved gifts other than magic water, so it's either 200 friendship points per day, or you get her her special cooked gift. Yeah, don't give her magic water. It permanently increases your stamina, and you can only get five of them. So if you give them to her, first of all, that's not that big of a boost because you can only get five of them. Second of all, your stamina meter isn't increasing at all. By the way, did I mention that she also can't be visited on rainy days and she doesn't participate in festivals? The 120 gift requirement is actually probably the least difficult part. You'll most likely be looking to marry her at the start of year four, at best. And to make things even worse, she doesn't even know what a farm is. You are a farmer. She has no clue what you do. Now that said, she is quite compassionate and very open to learning more about you, your work, the farm, animals, all that sort of stuff. And I think that keeps her out of the bottom tiers, so I'm going to put her in silver tier with Antoinette. Though, if you're the type that just has to go for the Harvest Goddess in Friends of Mineral Town, or Inara, or Inari, I forget, in Trio of Towns, etc, etc, then you know what? Marry that girl. She's probably gold for you, so don't worry about me being so rude with my ranking, and marry her anyway. There's a song like that, you know? Next up is Freya, a serious and career-minded woman who works in the city. She likes pretty things and hates tempura. So in order to talk about Freya, we have to come here in the very early morning before she heads off to work. And really, that sums up a lot of her character. But in order to talk more about her character, we need to talk about hedonism. Now, people have a particular image of hedonism. It's something like, oh, somebody reclining half-naked on a fainting couch, drinking wine and eating grapes, and blah blah blah. But in reality, hedonism is about pain. Specifically, the pain of one's life. Whether it's because they feel their life is meaningless, or because they're in a bad position. A hedonist doesn't seek to fix these problems, however. They only seek to distract themselves from the pain or to dull it somehow. The best way to describe it is that it's like breaking an arm and instead of getting it set and in a cast to heal, just taking dose after dose of pain medication while that arm is still broken. In the end, distracting oneself from the pain only makes the situation worse. It's an endless downward spiral that quickly makes a hedonist life nothing but pain and escape from that pain. And while Freya does not fit the popular image of a hedonist, she is a hedonist. In one of her heart events, Freya talks about how she feels like she's just spinning her wheels. She feels lost, and she doesn't know why. Instead of addressing why, she dives headfirst into her work. Rather than her work having meaning in and of itself, or being part of a more meaningful life, the work is the distraction from the pain of her meaningless life. This is no healthier for the mind or spirit than other distractions from the pain. Remember, a hedonist life exists in two parts, pain and distraction from pain. Her life would not have much more meaning with you in it. She would still resort to hedonism. All you would be is another distraction from the pain. All your children would be, assuming you'd even have any, is just another distraction from the pain. The only thing she has going for her is that she's easy, which is an allegory and a half. Chocolate is available at Felix's shop starting with the first bazaar, and it's a liked gift for her. It's difficult to afford it at first, but you can, and you don't have to worry about gathering flowers that are only available in one season, or growing tea bushes, or something like that. She also doesn't have any family in town that you need to befriend in order to marry her. 
There. Freya, you are evaluated. Just take your copper ranking. Now, don't worry. Things are getting better from here. We still have two waifus left. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, wait a second. Aren't there only five marriage candidates? Yes, but there are five waifus. Remember, Daisy is not a waifu. So that means that there are six on this list. Now, who could be the secret marriage candidate? Well, if you've been watching the series, you'll know that it is the true best waifu, Marion. Runs the cafe with her grandmother, Joan. Has a secret admirer in Raoul. She likes anything with herbs. Hey, me too. And dislikes bugs and fish. Marion, who is the perfect waifu, is not marriageable. She's not even romanceable. Okay, yes, sure, she has issues with marriage ever since her fiancé left her at the altar. But they could have made her romanceable and non-marriageable. Like, for example, Elisa from Sunshine Islands. She had heart events. You could romance her, but if you gave her the blue feather, she'd say, I'm sorry, I'm a nun, so I can't marry you. And I hope that if they ever do a remake of Grand Bazaar, that's what they do. Even if they don't make her manageable, they make her at least romanceable. So where does that put Marion? Well, like I said, she is the best waifu. So she is in the secret tier above gold. Yes, that's right. I deceived you. There is one more tier, and that is Pink Diamond. Marion goes there. Fortunately, she is still not marriageable. Which brings us to... Cherry. The mayor's daughter often worries about her dad. Loves the town very much. Likes simple things. Dislikes spicy food. Sherry checks all the boxes for an ideal waifu. She's kind, she's gentle, she's a pillar of the community, she can cook, and she'd probably be a great mother. This makes many classify Sherry as the boring pick. Let me explain to you why that's wrong. Evolution has imparted certain instincts within us, and many throughout history have gone for the exciting pick that led to them becoming genetic dead ends. These people did not pass down their instincts as well as those that went for the boring pick. People have become so arrogant about going against their instincts and disdainful towards those that listen to them, but our instincts are a guide to what actually works in life. The other options didn't, or didn't as well. Taking a time-tested path to ruin is nothing to take pride in. Sherry is the boring pick because she appeals to the instincts of those that were not genetic dead ends, that passed down their genes. She's the boring pick because nothing else is as good, and so nothing else got passed down as much as a preference for the Sherrys throughout history. If the Freyas throughout history had been the best choice, then Freya would be the boring pick, and Sherry would be interesting and unique. Now I'd be putting Freya at the top of this list. But that's not how evolution works. And evolution heavily punishes those, like Freya, that go against it. Sherry is the boring pick, because evolution has determined through billions of points of trial and error that she is the best choice by far. Sherry is the best choice for having a life worth living, rather than a life of emptiness and distraction from the pain that comes from rejecting evolution. For that reason, Sherry is objectively the best marriage candidate. Gold tier, and she gets the blue feather. Let me know what you thought of my waifu review slash tier list. Um, but other than that, that's going to have to be everything for today, and uh, I hope to see you later. Bye.